Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today's episode is a part of a two-part series I'm doing this week, leading into the week leading to the election, focused on the future. I very much think the abundance agenda is the future. I think the issues raised when it comes to building, when it comes to challenges in the environment and the material world are at the center of what our policy debates need to look like moving forward in so many areas beyond the environment. That's everything from the arsenal of democracy work that I do at the Hudson Institute to questions of housing, production, and of course, semiconductors. I'm chatting with Alex Trembath. He's the deputy director of the Breakthrough Institute, and he was one of the co-sponsors of the Abundance 2024 conference that I emceed earlier this month. The episode that's going to air on Thursday is going to be with Steve Tellis for our monthly Marshall and Steve show that everyone enjoys so much. He's going to focus on his articulation of where the Abundance agenda moves going forward. We're going to come back moving into the election, focusing more on the specific realignment topics. But I can just personally say at a certain point, we've rehashed all the questions of the diploma divide, questions about race and gender and the American political system. So focusing on where people who are in this audience should focus their attention moving forward is at the key. So hope you all enjoy this conversation with Alex on energy, climate, and of course, the abundance agenda. Huge thank you to the Foundation for American Innovation for supporting the work of this podcast. Alex Trembath, welcome to The Realignment. It's a real pleasure to be here, Marshall. Thanks. I'm excited to speak with you. So we're 15 days out from the election. So that's four episodes from a realignment perspective. What I'm trying to do here with the series we're recording this week is focus on the policy and the substance, the kind of question of what is this all going to mean moving forward? And I think you're in my intersections with abundance, energy policy, broad debates about how we should dispositionally approach policy issues is perfectly suited for that. So let's just start here. Um, would love to hear about your background, the work at the Breakthrough um, Institute, and how that intersected with the Abundance 2024 event that we put on earlier this month. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and, and be succinct because that is, that's sort of like asking me about my, my whole life story at this point. I've, I've only ever worked at the Breakthrough Institute. I got a job here as a research fellow right after college and have kind of worked my way up from the mailroom. So I'm, I'm deputy director now working on a whole bunch of things, including our research and policy advocacy, but also our events and our fundraising and development, our, our strategy, our communications. Um, we always thought of ourselves as the kind of abundance, progress-oriented environmentalists. We sort of uh, birthed the eco-modernist movement in 2015, which is, uh, you know, like an environmentalism that builds, an environmentalism that recognizes the value of technology, not just for human welfare, but for the well-being of the natural world. Um, and so... Uh, as this sort of abundance movement that has cohered over the last few years start, started to really get off the ground in a way that I'm sure your listeners are familiar with, um, it was a, a sort of a, a pleasant surprise to us in, in many ways. And, and to, I think, many of the sort of figures and organizations that have become associated with the abundance movement uh, before we started talking about it in those terms. Um, so, you know, Breakthrough is really founded as a, 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 as a counterweight to what we saw as an overly catastrophist and overly technocratic environmentalism. Um, you know, environmentalism, uh, which is really founded in the United States, and as we, just, as we talk about it today, really founded in the kind of post-war decades, um, uh, I think 1960s, 1970s, Earth Day, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, um, Endangered Species Act, National Environmental Policy Act. Um, uh, our, our founders are argued that by the dawn of the 21st century, that style of environmentalism, which really tried to sort of regulate trace pollutants out of sort of capitalistic industrial systems, uh, had kind of overstayed its welcome and, uh, and sort of, um, uh, and sort of become not a good match for the type of environmental problems that we as a society and we as a global population are dealing with today, things like climate change, land use change, biodiversity loss, which are not problems of like trace pollutants, like lead in gasoline or sulfur dioxides uh, in, in coal, but are actually the sort of emergent problems caused by industrial modernity and wealth. So like carbon is the, is the big 
uh, cause of climate change, right? You know, carbon emissions from combustion, both carbon dioxide and methane, um, increase the greenhouse effect, uh, and and that has implications for both human and non-human systems. Carbon is like th the atom at the at the center of the industrial revolution. It's not a trace molecule in modern industrial processes. It is what sort of modernization is what, like biogeochemically built on. Um, and so our argument is, was that to address environmental problems um, in the 21st century, we would need to sort of completely remake society or com completely remake the machines and the um, and the mechanics of uh, of modern wealth and prosperity, and that would require new technologies. It would require renewables. It would require nuclear. It would, it would require new ways of uh, new forms of transit and aviation and shipping. Uh, and that's just a completely different type of problem than regulating socks and knocks uh, uh, and and lead and mercury out of uh, uh, out of our factories. Um, and uh, and so that was sort of the idea that uh, the Breakthrough Institute was founded upon, smash cut to 15 years later. Um, and not only do you have, I think, an increased uptake, an increased uptake of that idea, largely downstream of the fact that we've proven that we can, in fact, make low carbon technologies cheap with solar and wind and batteries. But you have, I think, an increased recognition of the ways in which sort of the anti-growth and sort of technophobic undercurrents that we think describe modern environmentalism, there's an increased recognition of the way that those undercurrents are, are sort of stalling progress across society um, uh, and, and the ways in which sort of um, over-regulation and sort of proceduralism and, and vitocracy and government um, are limiting sort of... Uh, human well-being and sort of functional institutions. Um, I think there's a recognition during and coming out of COVID especially that, uh, again, sort of vitocracy, technophobia um, are, are limiting our sort of uh, ambitions and accomplishments as an American and in a global society. And I think that as much as anything um, explains the emergence of the abundance movement, um, which is, uh, you know, sort of highly, uh, highly compatible with, uh, with, Eco-modernism, and we can talk more about eco-modernism as such, um, but highly compatible, I think, with Breakthrough's long-term vision, which is um, uh, a sort of technologically focused approach to addressing environmental and human development challenges. Uh, so we've been very pleased to see the emergence of uh, abundance as a kind of broadly understood idea. Uh, obviously, it's still very early days. Um, uh, and very pleased that there's sort of a lot more both sort of research and advocacy energy behind the things that we think are important to addressing environmental and human development challenges, things like nuclear energy, things like permitting reform, uh, th things like increased productivity in the food and agriculture sector, uh, all that stuff. So I'll, I'll pause there and dig into any of that um, and just and just cap it off by by saying that it's a it's a really sort of exciting moment for us. Um, we are a, and and like we were talking about before the recording, we're on the precipice of a an election which will have, I think, you know, important implications for where this abundance agenda and where this abundance coalition goes next. Yeah, that was a great answer because you really tied together. 50 years of history into a coherent way that tracked your career and the institution you're affiliated with. Here's something I'd like to kind of think about to pull across a bunch of things you mentioned. So number one, what are these one at a time? I'm fascinated by the evolution of the eco-modernist case over the past 15 years, because on the one, actually, let me put it this way. So if it's the year 2007, I can't do math. So pretend eco modernism exists, pretend the breakthrough institute exists at that point. What is eco modernism? the alternative to, right? So what's put aside sort of like the wacky environmentalist protesters who are sort of like very much outside the local mainstream, if you're just a replacement level center-left Democrat 
who is interested in climate change and believes this is this existential issue we need to address through the policy apparatus. What was that status quo? Because I think in many ways, the real success of the Breakthrough Institute is that the gap between these two categories has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. But I'd say the gap was probably much bigger at the start. What was sort of like the center left or even center right? Because you have people like John McCain embracing cap and trade. Joe Lieberman talked about cap and trade. What was the consensus good faith that eco-modernism stood against? No one has ever asked me a question like that in those terms. Uh, so uh, kudos to the phrasing of that question, because I do think it actually gets at our sort of diagnosis of the problem in a, in a really interesting way, because, you know, Breakthrough is founded from the ideas in an essay called The Death of Environmentalism. Um, but as you're suggesting, Marshall, environmentalism didn't actually stop evolving <laughs> in the last 20 years, even as eco-modernism sort of was born and evolved in its own way alongside it. So to answer your question, you know, today, as you're saying, you've got sort of the climate movement marching in the streets, occasionally demonstrating, uh, including demonstrating at events that we have both been to now. <laughs> Um, uh, and, and, and you have things like the Sunrise Movement and Just Stop Oil. None of that existed 20 years ago. Um, you, climate change was on people's radar. Climate change has been on people's radar at least since 1988 when James Hansen from NASA testifies before Congress. Um, and in 2006, around the time that, that you're referencing, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth comes out. So people are paying attention to climate change, but the climate movement, sort of Bill McKibben, Sunrise, none of that exists. What environmentalism is broadly characterized by at that time, to get to your question, uh, is a focus on sort of a, a, a global, starting with a national, but then, a, then hopefully a global cap and trade program for carbon emissions. Uh, so we're going to cap the allowable emission of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and uh, and we're going to create a market for tri for tradable allowances for emissions um, as and well just as to explain this because it's been a while since cap and trade has been top of mind the idea being um, you could sell the excess carbon or emissions you had to other people. So this would create a market for reducing your overall emissions. So this is very much, on the one hand, it's top down, but on the other hand, you're using market mechanisms to correct for the fact that there's a, you know, pricing issue. The costs of climate change, the costs of carbon, et cetera, don't actually exist in the market. So we're just creating a market for reducing the actual emissions. Is that a fair enough articulation of it? Very much so. And as you say, this has not been a sort of proximate possible policy idea for at least 20 years uh, or, you know, about you know 15 or so years since it was attempted in the first Obama administration. But there were, you know, there are some economists and advocates said we should just pick a price, call it $25 a ton on carbon and levy a carbon tax on all economic activity or, or a segment of it. Um, what we actually tried was a cap and trade program where the idea is you don't pick a price, you pick a quantity, um, and then the market determines the price. So if you if you say we're going to cap emissions at such level, then in principle, um, and as has happened in uh, with with other pollutants uh, like sulfur dioxide under the um, uh, under the Clean Air Act, uh, then the market kind of determines what the equilibrium price is for for those allowances. Um, and so those were some of the. The, you know, sort of the big idea when it came to addressing climate change was we're going to either through a price or quantity based instrument levy a price on uh, on carbon emissions. And then you had things like increasing um, the stringency of cafe standards, the corporate average, average fuel economy um, in the, uh, on the transportation sector. Um, uh, through the Department of Transportation uh, and the, and the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and, uh, you know, outside of that, you had and continue to have um, a, a environmental justice movement, um, which uh, is, heavily fo is heavily focused on pollution in disadvantaged, low and middle income communities. Um, uh, and that's that had been focused largely on pollution from things like factories and highways, which is still the case. Um, and, uh, and all of that has sort of changed. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as you're saying, um, the, the, the environmental movement as it existed sort of 20 years ago, um, was if anything, um, 
you know, not very ambitious uh, from sort of early proto eco modernists point of view. You had you had a sort of advocacy agenda focused on what we at the time um, described a, as a cap and trade program that was wholly disproportionate to the scale of the climate challenge. Uh, you know, like the the cap and trade bill that was working its way through the through the Congress in the first Obama administration would have, in theory, you know, sort of impose a price on carbon emissions of between 10 and $20 a ton of carbon dioxide emissions, um, it, it, depending on how all of the offsets and the sort of loopholes shook out. Um, that's like 10 to 20 cents a gallon of gasoline, roughly. Um, uh, so, you know, certainly not nothing, um, uh, but not, not something that's going to completely remake society. Um, uh, we, we argued at the time that what was needed is, is not 10, 20, 50 cents or a dollar added to the price of gasoline. We needed a sort of radical industrial, uh, strategy to bring down the cost of low carbon technologies. Uh, so, you know, making clean energy cheap as a counterweight to making dirty energy marginally more expensive. Um, that strategy, that sort of proposal took, uh, various specific forms, you know, in 2005, Breakthrough helped found the Apollo Alliance, which advocated for a $300 billion clean, you know, sort of green energy agenda over, uh, over the course of a decade. If anything, that's sort of quaint now. We've got the Inflation Reduction Act, which the CBO says we'll spend like $350 billion on clean energy over a decade, but Goldman Sachs says it'll be more like $2 trillion in tax credit spending over that, over that duration. So as, as you're, as you're suggesting, um, reality has kind of caught up to the ideas of the early and proto eco modernists, even as environmentalism, um, has, uh, has sort of taken on, uh, some kind of views and strategies that, uh, I think run counter to a kind of abundance oriented approach to politics and technology in that time as well. But that's sort of roughly what it was like, um, uh, in, in terms of both the substance and the politics in, in the neighborhood of 20 years ago, you had a very sort of regulatory technocratic environmental movement that was sort of brought up in the, um, in the age of the clean air act, as well as the national environmental policy act, which meant a lot of sort of litigation around pollution and around, uh, infrastructure development. A lot of that is still with us, but what, what has changed is I think the, um, is sort of the successes of renewable energy technologies like solar and wind and batteries and the, as well as the emergence of the sort of eco-modernist and abundance movements and uh, the emergence of not just an environmental movement, but a really sort of climate and climate justice focused movement. Um, that are that are all kind of disputing the both the policy and the cultural terrain today. I think what's fascinating is if I was recording this episode with you, let's say circa 2013, it would feel my agreement with everything you're saying would feel a lot more conjecture based or a lot more partisan than it feels now because in many ways we've kind of run the experiment. Um, from the perspective of like the eco-modernist side, I wouldn't describe it as being victorious in the 2010s. I'm sure, there were a bunch of conferences, there were plenty of like great dinners, but in terms of the way that center left to center right people who were interested in these issues discussed were not eco-modernist in their nature. And I'm gonna put forth my sort of articulation of my theory of what happened here. I'd love to hear you critique yes and but whatever you want to do with it. So, number one you had the sort of Al Gore inconvenient truth theory, which is that the central political issue here is that climate denialism exists. It exists for a variety of reasons. It exists because of incumbency. People like the status quo and climate change is this additional factor that they just don't want to think about. Um, so that's where that denialism comes from. There's two, um, the fact that the fossil fuel industry, especially in the 1980s and 1990s, funded all sorts of like client denial efforts. And then you had that intersect with the Republican Party and Fox News. Therefore, let's put together this very ambitious like media project and, you know, ends up winning an Oscar, ends up being one of the most successful documentaries of all time. Not to claim that, you know, Al Gore's perspective was inconvenient truth or change anything. But once again, it's centering the case being we need to convince 
59 plus 2 percent of the population that climate change is real. And if they think it's real, we'll get over this obstacle to progress. However, I think what we saw happen was a, um, I think the change in the climate denial debate, um, was successful at a narrative level, right? Like you, you don't see Republican politicians anymore saying, well, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not sure whether or not like CO2 carbon affects, um, global temperatures. That, that very much has like been pushed to the side and the kind of more interesting, it's not denialist, but the smarter attack has become, yes, that's all real. But let's focus on the costs of transitioning away from carbon, which, to your point, is obviously a effect of the modern industrial world, but it prevents all sorts of benefits versus sulfur dioxide is a... 20th century result of industrialization, but there was no actual benefit to our lives when it came to sulfur dioxide. So we could just focus on isolating this cost and then creating policy accordingly. The problem with climate change is even if I then am convinced, okay, climate change is real. I'm not invested in arguing against people saying it's fake. Eh, actually, it turns out that the status quo or a future is going to be much worse. It's going to be more expensive. It's going to be this or this or that. And honestly, I think that we're going to be able to either like adapt to it or the effects will be as bad as they say they are. That's sort of where the Al Gore project like ends up. Um, and then two, the other strategy once again was, I guess there are three strategies here. The second strategy was let's pass um, regulation or let's pass legislation uh, on modeled after the Clean Air Act because we did this in the eighties. You know, the George H. W. Bush presidency was very friendly to this. Like, let's pass a carbon tax. Let's pass cap and trade. Let's do something in those categories. Um, that literally doesn't work because of the putting aside the merits of the individual proposals. Uh, I think that's a sector where even the Clean Air Act, if you tried to pass it today, just tabula rasa of like straight from the foundation would run into partisan politics and legislative log jam. So that ended up becoming a big issue. Ultimately, the Democratic Party chooses Obamacare and healthcare over big climate legislation for pretty obvious reasons. The final strategy, and this was the strategy that we were very much subject to earlier this month, was the climate change as modern, modern day civil rights movement approach, which is protests, aggression, heighten the contradictions, create costs for politicians who are too are right, but are still broadly from the coalition for not taking action. And we're going to be the Sunrise Movement and do a sit-in um, when it comes to Nancy Pelosi's office. When AOC is first elected, she comes and joins that sit-in. And that all just literally doesn't work. Um, like this is a I don't agree with the theory, but like this is a defensible, you write a white paper, you work at a big foundation or like a wealthy family who funds this type of work. And I could see how they kind of got there, but none of it worked. So those are sort of like the three approaches. So because those three approaches didn't work, but I also feel that climate change is a really, really important issue that is going to be incredibly existential for people. I'm only left of eco-modernism investing seriously in these technologies as quite literally the only alternative because we tried the other three approaches at a political, sociocultural level. I'd be curious like what you kind of think about how we've kind of run the experiment for the past decade. Yeah. Um, uh, just to touch on a couple things there, I, I do think you're absolutely right that, you know, there was no sort of grassroots or grass tops constituency for like big sulfur, right? Whereas the sort of political economy challenges of transitioning off coal, oil, and natural gas are real, even putting aside the sort of climate denying sort of big oil constituency over here. Like you actually do have not tens or hundreds of thousands, but millions of jobs in the United States alone that are in the sort of direct production and provision of coal, oil, and natural gas, uh, which was, which was not, re not really the case with the types of pollutants that we, uh, that we sort of either regulated or mitigated uh, to a substantial degree over, over the last 50 years, like lead, mercury, socks, knocks, smog, things like that. Um, which again, I think, I think gets back to um, the sort of central difficulty of, of climate change. Um, you know, we we have actually argued that uh, that carbon is not a pollutant <laughs> um, uh, in in the way that, that that these other things are. We shouldn't think of it as one. Um, uh, you know, car carbon dioxide. We we exhale carbon dioxide. That's not a climate denier talking point. That's a fact. 
uh, it's a scientific fact. And the, and the earth is out of balance in terms of the, the sort of long-term greenhouse effect because we, because our modern industrial economy is sort of exhaling too much carbon dioxide and trapping more solar radiation in the environment. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's fundamentally just in a biogeophysical way different than SOX or NOx or mercury or lead, which are, um, which are toxic uh, to human and non-human life in, in small sort of quantities in, in a way that, that methane and, and carbon dioxide aren't, which is, you know, to your point, that's the central problem here, not sort of climate denial and not a lack of sort of public awareness or concern about climate change. All, you know, throughout all of the last sort of 30 years, through, you know, throughout sort of the peak of Gore's project um, and up to today, where we have sort of climate defiance protesters disrupting abundance conferences, a majority of Americans has recognized that climate change is real and has, ne and has net negative consequences and has supported action to mitigate climate change. Uh, that number has gone up and down in terms of public support for, for climate action, although that that number isn't correlated with like climate denial campaigns. Um, it's correlated with the economy. Uh, you know, when we have uh, n negative economic growth in recent quarters, as has happened, you know, several times in the last 30 years, fewer people say they support climate policy. And when we have sort of a growing economy, more people say they support climate policy. Um, you know, this is, this is an, an old observation at this point, And I think is, uh, is sort of, uh, downstream of the fact that, um, uh, as you're saying, the, the only way we're really going to ad address climate change um, is through a sort of growth and technology oriented approach. Um, and, and as you're saying, you know, obviously, I, I, I agree. Um, that's the uh, that's the approach that seems to be sort of winning um, at, in the sort of policymaking making. Uh, arena um, there, you know, uh, we're not, a uh, not opposed to every regulation and carbon tax that has ever been proposed, but we don't think that they'll be the central policy instrument in lowering carbon emissions or dealing with climate change. And I think that that is kind of conventional wisdom in DC and, and elsewhere now, um, due to the, due partially to the success uh, that we've seen in low carbon technologies to date. And we think there's still quite a bit of progress to be made. Um, you mentioned at, uh, in, in your previous question, that in some ways um, the sort of gap between eco-modernists and environmentalists has narrowed. And I think in that way it has, right? So 20 years ago, you didn't have major environmental organizations saying that sort of solar and wind and electric vehicles are going to help us defeat climate change. You, you, had, uh, you had a much more sort of regulation and pollution focused approach uh, in the sort of environmental wing. Um, today, you do or have- to be precise real quick, it's not that these groups didn't want solar, EV, hydrogen, wind, et cetera. It's that those were downstream from the big policy changes you needed to make. In terms of like where you were articulating this in the messaging. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I would say that there was very little talk about solar and wind even 20 years ago. You, you know, really? like Gore, def, Gore definitely talked about it. Um, but, you know, if you uh, if you go to the sort of, uh, you know, sort of research and advocacy of Sierra Club, um, of NRDC, uh, you know, they, they weren't actually even talking much about renewables. They, they were talking uh, about sort of regulating polluters uh, by, by which they meant things like cafe standards and, um, uh, and, and cap and trade. It wasn't completely absent, but, you know, as, as you're arguing, um, there has been a convergence there. And I think a recognition of the, the capabilities that, that we have with solar, wind, EVs that we just didn't have 20 years ago. Um, and so that, that gap sort of has has narrowed um notably it the the gap still includes things like nuclear and hydrogen and carbon removal uh where you might have sort of quadrants of the environmental movement that are lukewarm or sort of open to you know sort of nuclear energy but for the most part the institutional environmental movement including the kind of the sort of more moderate groups are at at best sort of silent on, on on the issue of like nuclear energy or uh or, or carbon removal and things like that 
Um, at the same time, um, the even as there have been success cases on mitigating climate change, solar and wind especially, um, and even as the constituency for sort of growth and technology based approach to climate policy has expanded sort of exponentially, you do have this climate movement, as it describes itself, that sort of, as you're saying, sort of continues to try and heighten the contradictions, uh, uses sort of more and more kind of ostentatious sort of radical approaches to, uh, to, to sort of PR and, and to political advocacy. Um, and, and what's distinctive about, you know, the, the sort of radical flank of the climate movement, um, cause as, as they would be the first to tell you, it's not a monolith and they don't all agree with all the approaches is that you kind of have more radical tactics associated with e even less of a kind of substantive agenda. Um, so, you know, when you, you, the, the sort of big demand from most of these demonstrations is the declaration of a climate emergency. So a federal emergency declaration, but it's never been remotely clear to me, or I think anyone what that would even do. Um, uh, you know, at, at times you'll, you'll have, you know, groups like Sunrise or Climate Defi Defiant saying that we should just sort of end new oil and gas leases on federal lands, um, which, you know, would, would obviously have an effect, but, you know, most gas at this point, I think, is produced on private lands. Um, and so even a, even sort of a, a sweeping regulatory action on oil and gas production would not come close to ending oil and gas production in the United States, let alone around the world. Um, uh, you know, so, so uh, it's it's sort of conspicuous to me that as there has been sort of convergence on at least a flavor of techno optimism over the last 20 years between environmentalists and eco modernists. Um, and as there has been a recognition that carbon pricing is not going to be the sort of central policy in delivering climate action or mitigating emissions. Um, there has also been a kind of elevated climate catastrophism expressed in more and more sort of radical. And I think kind of kooky types of protests and demonstration, um, without a kind of uh, proportional increase in the seriousness of the policy proposals coming from the sort of radical flank. Yeah, and I think the thing that's interesting there, I mean, I would get in this argument with climate change folks in the 2010s is my biggest problem has never even been, my objection isn't even to the declaring a climate emergency thing. Not that I support that policy on a couple of different levels, but just a real gap between the stated, I won't even say catastrophism because that kind of has a negative implication, but the, the gap between how bad someone would articulate the problem as and the political approach. So for example, I'm someone who saw Greta Thunberg and was sort of like, oh man, like this person and the way she presents herself and the way she makes her argument, this person was made in a factory by some weird right wing billionaire. I don't literally believe this, but like there's, there's, there's very little gap between this joke and like the actual reality. Like this person is made in a lab slash factory to just sort of polarize the issue or not have the specific skill sets necessary to work their way around like the inherent like legislative log jams, right? Like if we live in a society that's increasingly defined by an urban rural divide and notably a real diploma divide between people who didn't, did not, did or did not go to college, um, college and graduate school educated protesters blocking traffic or like defacing art or gluing themselves to things is quite literally an approach that would create in a very sort of reactionary way backlash to the actual policy agenda. So that's just always been like my real, real frustration. I never start with like our policy disagreement. I just start, if this is what I was trying to do, I wouldn't actually go here. Um, but this actually gets to another approach that um, really mattered during the 2010s and in some ways kind of mirrors the articulation you have of like radical um, industrial revitalization here, which was like the green jobs approach, which basically said, uh, and this was a very interesting one in the late 2000s and early 2010s, it basically said, look, Alex or, you know, younger Alex is totally right about 
how bad this issue polls when we actually pull it. So not the question of is climate change real, should we do something about it, but are you willing to accept material costs to your living? Are you fine if you're coal mine closing? You very vo valuable voter in swing state Pennsylvania. Once you actually focused on those polling questions, obviously nothing was going to happen. And frankly, my pessimism on the policy approach of the 2000s and 2010s, I think has always been based on knowing that you have to go to the second level of the question, not the first level of the question, even if the first level of the question is an improvement if we're looking at the sort of Al Gore scale. But what you were doing then if you were focusing on green collar jobs was basically like, okay, so we need to actually be, we need to be very materialist and very deliverist focused. We need to say to a coal miner, hey, this is going to close your coal plant, or this is going to like really change the way your community looks. But the good news is the project of remaking the American economy in a greener category is going to be so ambitious that there will be new jobs for you. There's going to be new opportunities for you. There's going to be huge retraining opportunities. We could send you to college to be retrained as a converting electrician or solar panel installer. What happened to that narrative? Because it basically just went away. Um, and I think it's kind of because it didn't work. The jobs weren't the actual, but I'd love to hear your articulation of that fourth option that sort of I think of as leaning towards the eco-modernist perspective from the perspective of like, let's focus on the material, but no one talks that way anymore. Yeah. I think part of the reason that it didn't work again is sort of structural to the nature of a transition to a low carbon economy itself. Part of the reason that like solar and wind are more affordable on, on the margin today um, is because they're not very labor intensive, right? I mean, that's the whole idea. Like you put some solar panels in the desert and they just generate electricity just sitting there. Same with a wind turbine, right? When the wind is blowing, the blades are spinning and it's generating electricity and it doesn't require a natural gas or coal plants worth of workers to, to, to main or nuclear plants uh, sort of headcount of workers to maintain it. And that's actually part of the reason that it's more economical. It's a sort of dematerialization of the economy. This is what we see from sector to sector through things like automation in the industrial sector or things like productivity enhancements and mechanization and automation in agriculture. One of the ways that we actually grow as a society, as a, an economy and a society is by improving the labor productivity of our economic activity, which means fewer jobs uh, in uh, for, for a given sort of sector over time. Um, you know, like 200 years ago, 75% or 80% of Americans worked in farming. Today, it's less than 1%. Does that mean that we have less food? No, it means we have like 10 times as much food per person as we did 200 years ago. Um, and so the the, the green and jobs- one quick one one quick interruption. And what matters there- for the climate story is the transition to an industrial urban economy was like a great thing. Lots of wealth, rising upper class, like upper, no, not even upper, riding middle, rising middle class living standards. But if the promise was, hey, you live in rural America, you really like that, like that's super awesome. But don't worry, this industrial economy is going to perfectly replicate. And if anything, like increase your current lifestyle where you are living now in rural America, that just wasn't accurate. People still had to move to urban regions because the economy actually shifted. So, the, so it's not that the change didn't need to happen. It's not that there won't be people who get jobs in these sectors, but if you're just basically saying, just change your blue collar designation or self-conception to green collar, and it's just going to be everyone working at the solar panel installing company instead of working at a coal mine, that just wasn't accurate and things have never worked that way. Right. They haven't worked that way. They might have worked that way to a degree a little bit better, although I, I don't think that every coal miner would have gone to work for at a lithium mine, certainly. Um, but but I think I do think that it is notable that the sort of environmental movement, and even sort of policymakers were more than happy to to sort of incentivize the the sort of production and installation of solar panels and wind turbines and EVs and things like that, um, but make it almost impossible to open a new mine in the United States for uh, even when transitioning to low carbon technologies will require a lot of silver and lithium and cobalt and uranium and, and, and all of this stuff. Um, again, that's not a sort of slam dunk answer for a, a coal miner in West Virginia. Uh, when most of the lithium is in like Nevada and Arizona. Um, but I do think it's notable that, you know, sort of a, a bunch of the literal sort of uh, industrial production associated with the, the clean economy 
um, that does create jobs is effectively outlawed in, in the United States, um, while the, the, the jobs that are created um, um, are in the sort of installation and maintenance, largely in urban areas, right? Um, and so, you know, to almost to your point earlier about the sort of political economy of, of climate change, you have a constituency that's super concerned about climate change that is sort of overeducated relative to the American median, and you have the sort of economic benefits accruing largely to sort of educated urban areas where you, you see a lot of rooftop solar and sort of heat pump and induction stove installation and all of that's great. Um, but in the, in the meantime, the, you know, sort of, the, sort of jobs in, uh, in rural America um, uh, are, are under threat, um, particularly in the sort of coal sector, Le you know, less so in oil and gas lately, because we're actually still producing quite a bit of that. Um, and you have sort of environmental movement and a sort of policymaking cohort that are indifferent at best and actively hostile to the, the types of economic activity that might, uh, that might sort of replace some of those uh, rural economic losses, like, you know, like, um, like new, new mines, uh, and, and things like that. Um, so I, I think, um, that explains some of the challenges, uh, and, and some of the disappointments in the, the green jobs campaign. Um, you know, I, I think there were, you know, there were good reasons to, uh, that the green jobs campaign was created. Um, uh, you know, I think, Every sector and every policymaker was promising job creation coming out of the global financial crisis in 2008 and 9. Um, but what we have seen, you know, especially um, uh, over the last 10, 15 years, but a lot longer than that, is just a, a huge my a uh, huge shift in the American labor force from things like agriculture, industry, manufacturing, and mining um, to knowledge and services. Um, and that's just something that we have to contend with uh, a as we understand both the sort of uh, industrial economy of climate action, um, as well as the political economy of it. Um, and if all of the, um, if all the advocacy for climate action is coming from educated liberals in blue America and all of the sort of jobs benefits are going to solar panel and HVAC installers in blue America, then we shouldn't. And, and, uh, and, and we have sort of like figures like climate defiance and Greta Thunberg, like literally yelling at us on TV um, ab about why sort of growth and technology and capitalism are terrible. Then we should not be surprised uh, when, when climate change uh, sort of remains a polarizing issue, even though, as you say, sort of according to Hoyle, climate denial is much less common today than it used to be. And the key thing is, and I like what you said about the green collar jobs thing, because we're not here to dunk on any movement we're burying here, especially in the green collar jobs category. But what they were trying to do is work their way around a problem that I don't think climate defiance has firmly reconciled themselves to. Because once again, this problem I'm about to state gets at basically makes their entire theory of change collapse, which is we've run the experiment. Americans, and I would say Westerners in general, Let's put aside, I, I don't as much know the political valence of uh, climate politics in East Asia and the global South. So let's focus on the West. The West will just not accept degrowth as a model here. And green collar people were getting at the idea that, okay, this can't just be, we're going to drive less and there's going to be a cost. They, they basically, what they were trying to get at it is if climate change is purely framed through cost terms in exchange for medium to long-term benefit, it by definition is a losing political movement. So green jobs was a short-term but ultimately incorrect at a policy level attempt to square all of that, which is we're going to do cap and trade, we're going to do cafe standard regulations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And from those policy changes, you're going to see a new category of job be created. If it's going to be cleaner, if it's going to be more interesting. This can give you educational opportunities. And it just didn't really work here. But I think just the central central issue, and that's why it's so weird to me that you're seeing a real boomlet of degrowth-centered books and works and speakers, which is we've just run this experiment. It just doesn't work. I would I'll put forth a prediction. It doesn't matter. The, the, the American people broadly will not accept degrowth, even if that means more hurricanes in North Carolina. Florida, South Carolina, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just the, the, 
what degrowth represents is just so antithetical to, I think, people's everyday lived experience. And by the way, like how many people are going to actually fear? I don't fear. I live in Texas, right? I don't, I don't fear a hurricane. Um, you know, I'm privileged. So I don't have this problem, but like what I do see is people fearing like the increased cost of gas in terms of their everyday day to day. And that just has to be the starting assumption from a person who cares about climate and the environment. Um, so I would love you to hear just your talk about or your thoughts on degrowth as like a political ideology from a practicality perspective. Cause I'm trying to be generous here, but I genuinely just don't, I really just don't understand. I, I've, when I've tried to talk to degrowthers, we just have such and I'm a very empathetic person. That's why I'm a successful host. But we have just such a separate, like if we tried to talk with the climate defiance people, like let's say we have a different version of the Abundance Conference and we sit down, we're like, let's actually just like sit down. And like, I actually think it, would, I, it wouldn't work because our stated assumptions and beliefs are just so disparate. But that's sort of my take. I'd love to hear yours. Yeah, I mean, there's been, this is, an old dispute, right? You know, since at least Malthus and the Luddites, you have had sort of a, a wealthy privileged class rebelling against so, sort of whatever you call it, sort of growth technology progress uh, on the grounds that there is not enough to go around. Um, and, you know, it, on the one hand, it's an intuitively appealing or an, an intuitively compelling proposition that the earth or sort of natural resources are a fixed pie and there's only so much to go around. And so policies to sort of either support poor people in Malthus's age or policies to improve the technological productivity of industrial production in the Luddites age or technologies um, to, uh, or sort of technology and growth to, uh, to grow the economy today um, are outstripping sort of the earth's ability to uh to fit our species um or 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 to uh or, or to manage the sort of uh, pollution or, or or climate emissions um this is an old dispute and it overwhelmingly comes from the wealthy and privileged in society um you know can you clarify from, that in the luddite case then i'm just like i'm, I'm curious about that like weird because that, that that's the because as, as you're talking here i'm sort of thinking well at least with the luddites purely from a political theory perspective at least you're talking about a grassroots mass mobilization like for example i i think the i'm i'm, I'm an optimist on ai but if i look at the ai issue i think well wow, there's way more of a constituency for people whose status quo is upended by technological change in that case especially in a political system like ours that like favors like concentrated minorities that at least exists in the luddite case it exists in certain malthusian contexts um it definitely exists in AI context. It just doesn't exist in the climate context because the people, you know what the real interesting case would be? What if the people who were attacking climate defiance, attacking abundance weren't like people wearing nice suits who clearly went, actually, no, this was reported. They like they went to like local DC expensive universities. So we're not just being disparaging when we say that on a relative scale, they're privileged. But what if it was like actual like working class populist people in the way that like pushback against free trade really does have like a deeply organic deeply activatable section of voters. So I'd just love to hear like where you see like the the like climate protesters fitting into this sort of framework. It's actually a good point, an important correction that, yeah, you know, so the, the Luddites were an actually threatened constituency, right? Um, it, it would actually be more like sort of coal miners protesting the abundance movement because we're sort of pro-renewables and nuclear today, um, then it Oh, would that's a fun, sort of, I'm imagining yeah. that. That's a hilarious, but frankly, more intellectually logical, like, protest of the actual thing. But sorry, go right. on. Right. And, and funnily enough, that is the type of resistance to the Abundance Conference that we organizers hypothesized beforehand, as we were sort of gaming out sort of how organizing the first Abundance Conference in D.C. would land. Um, the sensitivity, the first sensitivity that we considered were like, were like, well, you know, there still is inequality in America. There still is sort of economic precarity. There still are sort of environmental justice and labor mo mobility concerns. Does a group of think tanks organizing a conference with hats that say abundance on them, is that kind of like misreading the room? Is that going to be perceived as sort of privileged? Uh, 
And there was, it was that kind of thing, not specifically like coal miners opposed to our sort of pro-nuclear vibes, but that kind of sensitivity that we were sort of co more cognizant of. And I actually had sort of conversations about, maybe because we hadn't hosted an event literally in the center of DC before, we didn't actually think <laughs> that we were going to get disrupted by climate defiance or sort of radical climate protesters in, in the way that we ultimately did. And I, again, I think that's, um, that's due to a, a kind of uh, serendipity and privilege more than anything else, where you have, you know, sort of really wealthy sort of uh, student protesters funded by multimillionaires and billionaires um, who, who fund the Climate Emergency Fund and Just Stop Oil and Climate Defiance, who are like literally in D.C., uh, I, I don't really know all, I don't know who all these protesters are, obviously. Um, uh, but um, I, th I think the reason that we got protested is because we were in like the center of American privilege where like privileged protesters also live. Um, uh, so so I, th I think a, a, a huge amount of it um, is uh, is just downstream of, of those kinds of dynamics. Uh, it's, it's why... I think so. It's why it's it's partially why I think the issue of climate change is is ranked like nineteenth or twentieth on the list of things Americans care about, um, because actually most Americans are not going to abundance conferences or protesting them, um, and and I, that that's the sort of nature of, of climate politics today that it it generates huge amounts of heat uh, in, in in particular sort of places like. You know the uh, the congressional softball game that climate defiance pr disrupted last year, or the abundance conference that they that they protested this month, um, but uh, but are, are not really reg but climate politics are not really registering for most Americans. We at Breakthrough would argue that that's actually an asset that we're better able to advance sort of technology and infrastructure based policies when those policies when those policies are lower salience and, and, and generate less polarization. Um, and, uh, and I agree with you. I think we've run the experiment in multiple ways um, on the political economy. And, and we see uh, that when we do try to increase the salience of climate change as an issue and try to expand the issue public and expand the climate movement, we see more polarization on the subject to the degree that now, uh, Donald Trump and Republicans are campaigning on a promise to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act, the, the sort of big clean energy spending passed in the, the, the Biden administration, when before the Biden administration, every Congress uh, spent some by, uh, passed some bipartisan legislation on clean energy spending. Um, and that's not to say it was a sort of universally popular idea. Um, you know, notably the Trump administration, uh, through, from 2017 to 2020 proposed slashing clean energy spending in all four of its budgets. But in e after each of, each of those four budgets, Congress ignored them and bipartisan majorities passed a, actually a 25% increase in clean energy R and D over the course of the first Trump administration. So this used to be, you know, so clean energy spending used to be a very bipartisan issue and it is at least less today. Uh, I think there's sort of big questions about what Trump and Republicans would do if they take power in a few weeks. Um, I would not expect for them to just straight repeal the Inflation Reduction Act and, and all the incentives. Um, but I do think that raising the sort of heat and salience of sort of climate ca catastrophism um, ha has increased the vulnerability of what used to be really sort of broadly popular investments in clean energy technology and infrastructure. Yeah. So a uh, quick note, I want to add to what you said then, you know, closing questions, but I'm. And look, when I first came across the abundance stuff six months ago, I, I really did want to steel man the bad version of this. And I think we benefited from the abundance perspective. The fact that the protesters just saw the public schedule, saw Matt Iglesias. Matt's very polarizing. He's very trolly. So like he just like brings in very much to his knowledge, these sorts of persons. But I think because they didn't understand the abundance agenda or the abundance movement, they couldn't launch what I think would have been a more serious critique, which is basically, and this, and this wasn't the argument made at any of the, any of the panels. So we, we passed this test, but here's the real test. Like there's just a version of the abundance agenda that just would be very just, you know, ultimately 
all that matters is abundance or, you know what, like who cares if we're using, um, or, you know, we should sort of mourn the existence of coal and gas and all these things. The climate change thing is real, but ultimately we have to deliver to the American people. It's all that basically matters. There's a drill baby drill version of the abundance movement that I think would be a kind of disingenuous, but be very just sort of like blackpilling from that. And that wasn't, that wasn't the argument. So, but what I, what I would have done if I were them is basically say, look, these policy wonks have all these big ideas, but what's this actually going to result in? It's actually going to result in incrementalist, non-effective transitions to an abundant energy future that doesn't actually exist. Like we live in an era of limits, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't agree with these arguments, but they're more coherent and serious versus a Matt Iglesias during an incredibly tight election obviously supports not banning fracking in one of the most important must-win swing states for Kamala Harris, um, which obviously if Trump were to win the election, you're going to get nothing you want on climate change. So if it's just like an interesting like vulnerability that the abundance agenda has um, that I think I would launch as an attack or like a warning shot, but that wasn't the one they really identified. But um, last two questions here. So so number one would just be, I'd love for you to, so I'm, I'm recording this from Texas. And what I think is so fun, fascinating about the abundance agenda is it does what any successful early 21st century policy movement does, which is it cuts across like the weird partisan sociocultural dynamics, which is that I'm in Texas, super red state. This is a state that builds things. You're in California, super blue. Like these are the two poles of the American, you know, body politic in the 21st century. California doesn't build things despite all the narrative reasons against building clean energy in Texas and all the narrative reasons in favor of building in California. So folks have sort of asked, why, why am I doing more energy abundance agenda focused work? And it's because I think the issues that we're raising here are actually at the core of quite literally everything when it comes to these dynamics. So can you talk about the Texas versus California dynamic and how it's revealing about different paths forward? Yeah. So, you know, historically kind of a uh, permissive policy environment for technology and infrastructure and development has been associated with kind of with red states, um, with, uh, you know, like the, the classic example on at least the housing front is Houston, which has no zoning compared to Berkeley, California, the birthplace of inclusionary zoning. Right. Um, and uh, and there and. The, that was kind of, as, as you're saying, the, the poles of the American cultural body politic for a long time. You had sort of blue states and urban areas that uh, were that invested a lot in sort of regulation and in, in zoning and in you know and in, in, in many good ways and sort of trying to get rid of pollution um, and sort of clean up the air and the water. Um, and, and, you know, like, like, uh, like I said at the top, there were important sort of victories there, certainly on the sort of environmental perspective, um, the air and the, and the water uh, and, uh, and the soil are much cleaner today than they were 50 years ago. And we, um, and we see that in evidence in sort of uh, rates of death from cancer and in AQI, or air quality index and, and, and all sorts of things. Um, what's, uh, what, what's happened um, as the sort of American population has grown, as, as our sort of post-war 20th century infrastructure has started to either strain or crumble, um, and as there have been sort of my, uh, increased migration from rural areas to suburban and urban areas, um, is, is that uh, our sort of uh, our infrastructure um, both can't necessarily accommodate uh, a, a, gr a significant growth in population when you're not allowed to build housing, you're not about to, or, or, or you're, it's not easy or feasible to build new tunnels and bridges and trains and highways. Um, and we're seeing that the sort of uh, industrial energy and agricultural systems that have sustained our population to date um, are, uh, it's not able to build, we're not able e able to easily build replacements for those um, given the sort of regulatory um, zoning and, and other restrictions, particularly when we need not just replacement natural gas plants, but when we need whole new categories of technology. We need solar farms, we need transmission lines, we need nuclear power plants, we, we, need, we, need, we need things like that. Um, and it turns out that the kind of uh, more permissive regulatory environments that are 
that predominate in states like Texas are more accommodating of the of the kind of frank uh, of frankly of like the Green New Deal than than blue states are. Um, and I think that there has been increasing recognition of that. Um, you know, at at, at, at a uh, used to be a kind of unintuitive conclusion over the last decade or so. And then I, I do think that it really can't be sort of overemphasized the degree to which COVID lockdowns, vaccine shortages, sort of like just incomprehensible scientific guidance around the pandemic, whatever you think of it, it changed every six weeks <laughs> um, uh, for years, actually. Um, I think that there is just a really widespread recognition um, that sort of material and supply chain shortages and inability, an inability to like build and deploy infrastructure and the sort of haplessness of the elite and scientific class in the United States, all things associated with sort of blue regions and blue America are just failing us. They're just falling short. Um, so more than any like one thing, more than like the uh, the difficulty of building wind farms in California. We've barely expanded wind capacity in California in a decade, more than um, the big dig taking 20 years in Boston, more than COVID, more than school lockdowns. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it was the convergence of all of these things around the sort of gl global emergency um, related to COVID and its aftermath that made, made people, that sort of produced the abundance movement, if that sort of gets at your question. Yeah, it does. And I think what's interesting about California, and you see this playing out, um, California can't build in these clean categories, but because of the uniparty nature of the state, California can pass an electric vehicle mandate. Okay, what's the problem with that? That's going to obviously define a lot of these industries, but you're now seeing, I think this is in Michigan, like Elisa Slotkin running for Senate as a Democrat is having to say like, no, 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 don't worry. I'm not going to take away your like combustion engine car. I'm not like that California person. So what California could do is it can very much not do the thing we actually need to do. And that I think is quite exportable, which is like the culture of building in the real world. But what it can do is the very like top down. You could only pass when you have a solid blue state legislature stuff that doesn't play well in the rest of the country. So here's just the last question, because I want this to be a future facing episode. I'd say the biggest challenge facing the abundance movement and the parts of the bipartisan apparatus that are now syncing up, and this is across so many different policy areas, is we can allocate money, we can pass bills, we can do bipartisanship, but we clearly can't actually build in these spaces. So for example, um, I work in the defense space, we can say everything we want about needing to have an American drone industry and produce more artillery rounds, we just haven't figured out how to do it. We can say we need to deploy all this rural broadband, we can't actually do it. We can't actually rebuild infrastructure quickly enough or do the clean energy transition we need to do. So how do we actually, so I'm just saying that but I think the next step for breakthrough, for my work, for all these institutions like Niskana that are working on this is actually helping answer the question of, We've kind of spent the money or won the, we, we, we've won the fight that we could pass big legislation. But what we can't do is help Pete Buttigieg build more than eight EV charging stations, despite billions and billions and billions of dollars. So you could close out on this. What is your thoughts on that being like the next stage of where this movement needs to actually advance? Just to be a little reductive uh, about it, um, I, I think if I had to give you a, a simple answer to that question is that we need a lot more trade school in the United States. So this is actually related to what we were talking about earlier, right? Where sort of a, a what, what do they call it? Um, a, a, an overproduction of elites produces both sort of uh, the, the sort of crazy politics of climate change um, and the polarization associated with, with climate change as an, as an issue public. Um, uh, and it, uh, it does not produce the types of things that you need to deal with climate change. Uh, sort of uh, engineers, um, inventors, uh, sort of even entrepreneurs, um, installers. Uh, like, like, you know, I was just uh, talking to a friend in uh, here in, in Berkeley in the East Bay in California who's an electrician. Um, and uh, he has way more work than he could than he can possibly do because there is an electrician shortage in again like the most climate conscious part of the country 
Um, and so, uh, you know, I, and I, I say this as somebody who went to an elite university and graduated with a, a degree in economics, like I'm not really walking the talk here. Um, but uh, that's that, that's sort of where my mind goes on that really central question that that you're leaving us with, Marshall, is that we have a bunch of like um, advocates, including myself, um, and we and have myself sort of, to be yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, I didn't want to presume. Um, the podcast uh, mics in front of us really give away right. the game here. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a giveaway, um, and we have you know policymakers who um, uh, are you know sort of meaningfully in, investing in emerging sectors. But we have kind of created a, uh, a sort of a labor force and uh, so an, an American polity um, that doesn't build stuff. Um, uh, you know, there's some kind of uh, bright spots. You know, you mentioned earlier that Texas builds stuff and California doesn't. And I totally agree with that. On the other hand, you know, we hosted Abundance 2024 two weeks ago. A week and a half after that, I went to the Progress Summit here in Berkeley, California, which was put on by the Roots of Progress and Institute for Progress and a bunch of these other organizations. It's a sort of overlapping constellation of progress and abundance institutions and figures. Um, and what was interesting to me about the Progress Summit compared to the Abundance Conference uh, was it was very Silicon Valley heavy. Um, and that is a group of people that sees themselves as builders. It's just they're building something kind of different, um, which, is, which is largely they're building like neural nets and, and sort of large language models um, and, and things like that. But, they're, but I think they're building sort of new sort of infrastructure uh, and uh, sorry, building new sort of information technology and digital technology so much <laughs> that we, we have so many bits that we're starting to need more atoms. So like the, the sort of like leading driver of, uh, of uh, at least um, uh, the, the sort of bleeding edge of, elect of growing electricity demand these days is coming from data centers um, as much as it's coming from electric vehicles. Um, and so I, I do think that we're starting even in California, even in sort of the deeply dematerialized part of the American economy that is Silicon Valley, we're starting both to see a, uh, a sort of attitude of building things and a, a uh, an, an awareness that we need to build not just things for uh, not just sort of um, uh, fiber optic cable that can transmit bits, but we need uh, to be to be a culture that produces atoms and molecules, um, and, and that is the the type of both like regulatory and, and industrial sort of and supply chain experience that we have kind of uh, put on the back burner a, as, uh, as a culture and, and, a, and, so, and sort of a policymaking endeavor for decades. Um, and, uh, and it is something that I think will be, as you're, as you're saying, Marshall, a pretty, you know, a, a pretty big lift for the abundance movement, which a, as it is so far, um, like sort of climate protesters, you know, largely is working in think tanks and, you know, sort of working on Capitol Hill um, and is and is writing books. Um, and so that's the that's the kind of area of both of sort of advocacy and of sort of recruitment that I would want to sort of the abundance agenda to go next is like, who are the engineers? Who are the installers? Who are the who are the drivers? Who are the inventors? Who are the builders? How are we producing sort of uh, uh, an American society where uh, sort of more builders can uh, can create a sort of prosperous, fulfilling life, um, and and hopefully uh, that will allow the sort of think tank advocates to. To continue to thrive as well, because if anything, we're getting more than our fair share of this. <laughs> Ending on uh, your and my continued thriving is a very, very key point. But I do just love closing on that answer because you've just successfully answered the question I've gotten from listeners, which is like, what do all the climate and energy questions? And these aren't asked hostilely, but like, what does the climate and energy conversation have to do with all the other big picture stuff? But you just basically answered it, which is that they are just in the most whiteboardable bullet point way these clear diagnoses of broader problems in American society that the mental framework we're going to need to approach them are going to apply to other areas as well, too. So, Alex, this has been really great. Thanks for spending a more of a decent amount of time with me. Thanks for joining me on The Realignment. Thanks so much for having me, Marshall. 